In this first theory session of the problem solving test course, I will explain the generic approach to solving the test questions. I will explain why the McKinsey problem solving test closely resembles a consulting engagement and why you should deal with it accordingly. We will also split the questions into four major categories or groups. And finally, we will discuss an algorithm which we will use for tackling the problem solving test questions. So what do we know about the PST? It's a test administered by McKinsey & Company to weed out weaker candidates before they proceed to a live interview. The test lasts 60 minutes, or in rare cases 75 minutes, and consists of three business cases and 26 questions. The test is actually similar to GMAT and GRE, but is a bit trickier. Only about 30% of candidates pass it, and you need to get about 19 questions right. What is so difficult about the test? The time limit is very stringent. If you had three hours to solve the test, it would not cause a problem and you would not be watching this video. Then, there is too much information available for solving the test questions. Some information is just redundant. Also, you need to be super efficient in problem solving and know what you are doing in every moment of the test. And finally, there are lots of small details you need to pay attention to. Does this setup sound familiar to you? If you get into management consultancy, this is what your day-to-day -day work will look like. Lots of information, time pressure, intellectually demanding problem-solving sessions. You will need to split complex business problems into small questions, find solutions to each, and then carefully assemble the details into the big picture. So here's the major point of PST, right? It resembles a consulting engagement. McKinsey uses it to check if the candidates have the potential to become good consultants. And how do you pass the test then? By acting like a consultant. I will help you do that. Firstly, consultants like planning and structure. In private equity due diligence engagements, for example, which are the most challenging in terms of time constraints, Teams extensively use predefined plans and checklists. Secondly, consultants always follow the 80-20 rule. Do the 20% of work, which brings 80% of the impact. We will also search for quick rather than straightforward but time-consuming solutions. Thirdly, consultants enjoy feedback. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, right? I will share extensive feedback on your performance in the practice part of the course. Let us use our structuring skills to tackle the first problem of the course, bringing in order test questions. The questions closely reflect the flow of formal logic. Premise or reason, then fact, then conclusion or result. The test questions are split roughly uniformly among these types. Premise questions fall into two subgroups and both subgroups require logical reasoning or inference, but not calculations. The first subgroup is the root cause reason questions, in which you need to find an explanation to a specific fact. Questions like which of the following if true would best or would least explain the date in exhibit one all fall into this category. The second subgroup is supporting analysis or supporting information. In these questions, you need to find best additional analysis or best additional information leading to a specific fact. For example, which of the following ideas would not help address fact X in exhibit Y? Fact questions fall into four subgroups. The first one is estimation, which is data question not requiring precision. The second is precise computation, obviously a data question requiring precision. And then there is word problem, which is uh, building an equation or formula and solving it based on the data in the text, in exhibits or tables. And then there is ranking, which is the fourth subgroup and which is the easiest subgroup of them all, where you need to rank several options by their value. Conclusion questions fall into two subgroups, those requiring calculations and those not requiring calculations. These question types require different problem-solving approaches. For example, in conclusion questions, 
you do not need to read all options if you have found the right one. Whereas in premise questions, you need to read everything to make sure your option is the best one. At this point, you might wonder, have we considered all question types? Actually, there is one more group. I call it last 13% or everything else. We should make our list of question types messy. Here it is. A recommendation, formula, and client interpretation. Luckily, they benefit from the same problem-solving algorithms as the previous three types, so we won't have to learn too much extra stuff. Each of these test types deserves an in-depth discussion and will get its own theory session. Okay, now that we understand what questions we can expect from the PST, let us look at the generic approach to solving the test. We are in a consulting setting here. Lots of information and little time. How do consultants surf through the piles of documents and spreadsheets they get from their clients? They come up with hypotheses and systematically check them with data points. Hypotheses are crucial questions which point to specific pieces of information. This way, consultants only deal with what matters most rather than everything. In PST, questions play the role of hypotheses. Thanks God we don't need to come up with them. We just need to use them as guidance for the information we need. This is why our consulting generic approach to the test runs as follows. Step number one, read and understand the questions, but do not read the options yet. Step number two, index the data using questions as guidance. Step number three, for each question, study options and pick the best one. Step number four, after a set of four to five questions, track time. And step number five, record your answers to the answer sheet. Let us now look at each step in more detail. Step number one, understand the questions. We need to read a set of four to five questions first and then figure out what's going on in those questions. We need to circle keywords like subjects and actions, data, inclusion exclusion comments, reference to exhibits and text. We also need to figure out whether the question asks a positive piece of information, best, most, will, true, can, etc., or the negative piece of information, which is least, will not, false, cannot, etc. Also notice if the questions require computations or not. This is important because computations are usually more time consuming. Step number two is indexing the data. We need to skim the text and skim the exhibits and tables. We don't need to read them in detail. We just need to understand what's going on in the text and what's going on in each paragraph of the text. When skimming exhibits and tables, we need to pay attention to titles, units of measurements, access, and connections among exhibits. Again, we are not looking for trends. We are not looking for too specific detail. We just need to understand what's going on in the text or in the tables or in the exhibits. We just need to index the data so that we can come back to them if needed. Step number three is picking the best option. We need to check if the answer options are very similar. If they are, perhaps we can run just one calculation without checking all four of them and conclude about what's the correct answer. Also, if their answer options are too far apart, we can understand that some options are just unrealistic, too big or too small, and get rid of them. This is especially true for fact questions. Also, in certain questions, some options are ridiculously hard, while others are very simple. When you find a ridiculously hard option, don't check it, skip it and move on and check other options, because it might be the case, and it is most likely the case, that the simpler options will be eliminated. And in this case, you will end up with the ridiculously hard but unchecked option is the correct one. Also remember that correct options are based on data rather than on your experience, intuition, or whatever. Make sure that all the answers you mark are actually based on a piece of data in an exhibit, in a table, or in the text. Now, if using the elimination technique you were able to eliminate three out of four options, great, you have your answer and you can move on. If you are left with two or three options, you'll need to use some question-specific techniques, which we'll discuss in the future theory sessions of this course. The next step is tracking time. The worst thing a strong candidate can do is get stuck on a difficult question for 10 minutes, solve it correctly, but then skip other five easy questions. Remember 
that the total number of correct answers count, not the difficulty of the questions you answer. Always devote some time to every one of the 26 questions. There are extremely difficult as well as ridiculously easy ones. You need to conquer all of the latter as well as some of the former and then you will pass the test. Here is a geometric technique you can use to track time. You split the 26 questions into 5 question blocks and you assign specific time limits to each question groups. For example, you need to solve the first 5 questions in 10 minutes, the first 10 questions in 22 minutes, the first 15 questions in 34 minutes, the first 20 questions in 46, and all the questions in 58 minutes so that you still have 2 minutes to relax. Then what you do is check timing after each checkpoint, after each question block. For example, you solved 10 questions and you look at the time. If you spend more than 22 minutes solving these 10 questions, you need to speed up, meaning that you'll need to skip some really hard questions in the next five and try to come up with quick answers or educated guesses. On the other hand, if after, say, 15 questions, you spend less than 34 minutes, you can slow down a bit, devote more time to difficult questions, or maybe even go back. In this fashion, you will be able to cover all the 26 questions of the test within 60 minutes and devote some time to each and every question. Of course, this time split is not obligatory. So you can decide to spend more than 10 minutes on the first five questions, but fewer minutes on the following five questions. It depends on your own preferences. Just make sure that the time is distributed more or less uniformly among the 26 questions and that you have time to deal with all of them. Step number five is recording your answers. This step may sound obvious, but it is very easy to neglect. But think of it this way. You're a consultant and you've created a brilliant business solution, but you have not prepared the PowerPoint for the client meeting. Will your partner be happy with your performance? Well, I guess no. Same thing here. What counts is what is recorded on the answer sheet. So make sure answers are there before the time's up. The answer sheet is somewhat tricky. Devoting just two minutes to transferring all 26 questions is a poor decision. Once you're in a hurry, it is easy to make a stupid transferring typo and miss five or 10 otherwise correctly solved questions. Transfer your answers one by one or in blocks of four to five questions, but not all 26 questions at once, and definitely not at the end of the test. Okay, now let's see how this theory works in practice. Here's the official PST A 2012. Question number one. According to the C of kosher francs, okay, C of kosher francs, which of the scenarios presented in exhibit one, exhibit one, would satisfy Fooding's requirements? Okay, Fooding's requirements. So we make a note that we'll need to look for seal and we'll need to look for requirements. Question number two, which of the following measures, if done alone, would definitely not help address the objectives of the seal of kosher francs? So we make a note that we'll need to find the objectives of the seal. Question number three, which of the following statements is valid based on the date in table one? Valid and table one. Question number four. Which of the following values is best estimate of kosher francs revenue in year four under scenario C in exhibit one? So kosher francs revenue, year four, scenario C, and exhibit one. The next step is indexing the data. Paragraph number one, Kosher Franks is a company that sells hot dogs and other packaged meat products such as salami. Okay, so this tells us about the business of the company and we find out that Kosher Franks sells hot dogs and other packaged meat products. If we need to go into more detail about the company, we know that we'll need to go to the first paragraph. The second paragraph. Kosher Franks customers are large grocery store chains or grocery distributors who sell to smaller chains and independent grocery stores across the US. The prices mm -hmm, depend on many factors. Okay, so this is customers and prices. Customers and prices. 
The third paragraph introduces table number one, and we're able to read it right now. So table one brings us information about revenue and revenue growth for Kosha francs. Revenue this year and growth average over the last five years. The units of measurement is millions, millions of dollars and percents. And then different rows indicate different product types. Let's read the next paragraph now. Kosher Franks manufactures all of its own products and invests significantly more resources than its competitors. Okay, so this is about competition. Competition. Mm -hmm. And reputation and brand. The next paragraph. Kosher Franks was founded almost 100 years ago and until recently was a family business. However, uh, the company was acquired last year. Okay, so this is history. And then the last paragraph. Okay, the sea of Kosher Franks. Mm -hmm. Ways to improve sales. 10% annual sales growth. Okay, this is the goal of the seal. And we remember that this is important for question one and question two. So we'll definitely go deeper into detail once we start solving those questions. Okay, exhibit one, scenarios for growth of Kosher Frank's sales over the next five years. And the unit of measurement is percentage of year zero sales. Okay, so year zero sales is 100%. Then year one sales under scenario A is 111%. Year three sales under scenario D is 115%. So I guess this will be important for question four. Now that we have indexed the data, we can start solving each of the questions separately. So question number one, CEO of Kosher Franks uh, satisfy food inks requirements. Now let's look at the food inks requirements. Mm -hmm. Improve sales growth while maintaining good levels of profitability. Actually, all of the scenarios here show sales growth, right? Because all, the, all of the points are higher than 100%. So this is not very helpful to us. Let's read on. He states that the 10% annual sales growth should be the target. Okay, this seems to be more useful because in some of the years the growth is less than 10%, like here, while in other years it's more than 10%. But let's read more just in case. In five years time, he wants to be able to look back and see an annual sales growth of 10% or more for each of the previous two years, our Kosha Franks will no longer be part of Pudding. Okay, this is interesting. We need to look at, at years three, four, and five. And we need to make sure the growth from year three to year four is more than 10% and the growth from year four to year five is more than 10%. Now let's check all the scenarios and see which one fits this criteria. Scenario A, this is the blue line, 129 in year three, 136 in year four. The growth is 7 over 129, which is definitely less than 10%. So scenario A is out. Scenario B, 105 in year 3, 116 in year 4, and 130 in year 5. The growth here is 11 points out of 105, which is more than 10%. And here, 14 points out of 116, 
which is also more than 10%. So both of the requirements are satisfied and B is our answer. Here we don't even need to read scenarios C and D because there is just one correct answer. So skip them and move on. Question number two. Which of the following measures if done alone would definitely not help address the objectives of the CEO? We remember that the objectives of the CEO here are improve sales and maintain good levels of profitability. Improving sales growth is our first criterion and profit margin is our second criterion. Let's look at option A, lowering the price of select Kosha Frank's products. Would it help grow revenue? Well, it might if people start buying more of the products. So I say probably yes, probably no, we just don't know. Option B, introducing new products into Kosha Frank's range. That might help increase the revenue we are not sure about the profit margin, of course, because we don't know the profit margins for these products. So here's a question mark. Option C, removing a category of products from the existing Kasha Franks range. Well, this definitely would not help increase the revenues because we are taking one of the parts of the sum. For example, if we had three product lines, A, B, and C, and we now get rid of uh, product line C. That means we are left with A and B, and the sum of A and B is definitely less than the sum of A, B, and C. So this will not help the growth, and this seems like a good candidate for the right answer here. But let's look at option D just in case. Increasing the advertising of Kosha Frank's products in the mass media. Okay, increasing advertising might actually help, because it might bring more customers. So among the four options, C would definitely not help address the objectives of the CEO. And this is our answer. Question three, which of the following statements is valid based on the date in table one? Let's check all the answers one by one. A, revenue for other products was more than 20 million five years ago. Other products? 15 million this year and decline of 7% per annum over five years. So that translates into a decline of seven times five, about 35%, or perhaps even more. Well, I'm not sure because that might actually be close to 20 million five years ago. So I'd rather skip this option and see if other options are easier to solve. Option B, hot dog revenue was more than 350 million five years ago. So this year is 366, and it also grew at 4.2% over the last five years. So that means a growth of 21% or even more. So we have a proportion here. 366 is 121%. And 350 is 100%. Is it true that 366 is 25 percent more than 350? Well, no, this is not true. That means that B is actually false, and B is not a valid conclusion. Option C: Sales of sliced meats grew by no less than 1.2 percent in each of the last five years. Let's look at sliced meats here. The growth is 1.2%, but this is average annual revenue growth. So there might have been years in which the growth was more than that and years in which the growth was less than that. We just don't know. So C is unknown and C cannot be the valid conclusion. D, total sales for kosher francs did not grow at all in the last five years. Now we can check that. So if we look at the product lines, we have three product lines and then other products, meaning that these four cover all the revenue of kosher francs. 
And we also see that there is the huge bucket called all beef hot dogs. And this bucket grew. And everything else, this sum of everything else is just smaller than this bucket. So that means that the growth of this big bucket was enough to make sure that the overall revenue of the company grew. So D is actually false. The revenue of the company grew in the last five years. So we're left with option A, which is the difficult to check, but which is the correct one, the only correct one by elimination. Question number four, which of the following values is the best estimate of Kosher Frank's revenue in year four under scenario C in exhibit one? Okay, the options are pretty far apart, which is good, which means that we won't need to be very precise in our calculations. By the way, what do we need to do in our calculations? We need to take the revenue this year, year zero, and multiply it by growth under scenario C up to year four. Revenue this year is 366 plus 65, which is about 430, plus 55, which is 485, plus 15, which is about 500 million. And then the growth under scenario C up to year four is scenario C, year four, the value is 120% of year zero, so the growth is 120 over 100 or 1.2. So the answer is 500 times 1.2 equals 600. Now we'll look at the options and see that only the option D is close to this answer because everything else is just way smaller. So we cross them out and our answer is D. The next step is tracking time. We look at the clock and make sure that we spend not more than nine or 10 minutes on these questions. If we spend more than nine or 10 minutes, we need to speed up a bit and probably skip some time consuming questions in the next block of four or five questions. The next step is recording our answers. Okay, so question one, the answer is B. Question two, the answer is C. Question three, the answer is A. And question four, the answer is D. And we are done with these four questions. All we need to do now is repeat the same algorithm for the remaining 22 questions and we'll be fine. Let's recap what we have learned today. Our approach, we will treat PST as a consulting engagement, namely use a structured approach, look for 8 to 20, work crazy hours and leverage feedback. Question types, there are four of them, premise, fact, conclusion, and other. Each type has its own solution algorithm, which we will deal with in the following theory sessions. Solution steps. One, understand the questions. Two, understand the data, index the data. Three, pick the best option. Four, track the time. Five, record the answers. All right, that's all for today. If you have any questions, feel free to leave comments below. Thanks for your attention and until next time.